1900s, photographers were longing for the day when they could photograph in true colour. Their search for pictorial photography involved them in mysterious cookery in darkrooms on both sides of the Atlantic. At last, in 1907, colour photography became, as one of them put it, an established fact. These are the early colour plates of the English photographer J.C. Warburg. But before colour arrived, there were other alternatives to a monochrome image. By toning a print, a master photographer like Steichen could create beauty out of a swamp, using the same negative to convey different moods. The Frenchman Robert de Marchi takes a straightforward negative of a car and by special printing produces an art print. This is not a chalk drawing, but a photograph, created by the gum bichromate process. Peter Frederick demonstrates how. The sensitizer which is used is ammonium bichromate, um, which is applied to the surface of the print with a piece of cotton wool. With this process, you are literally making your own photographic coating, and it can be applied to any surface, not just the traditional paper. The surplus has to be removed before the next stage. Coating consists of a mixture of gum arabic and pigment. Uh, pigment can come out of ordinary watercolour or gouache um, and it's mixed into the gum arabic to, to provide an even smooth um, creamy mixture which one then coats onto the surface of the prepared sensitized paper in the following manner. Traditionally, the finishing was done with badger hair brushes, but Peter Frederick has found a modern paint roller does the trick of evening out the surface. After the paper has been dried, it is placed in a printing frame with a black and white negative. It is checked to see if it's in register. It's then left to print in daylight for about five to ten minutes. After printing, we place the print in the water to develop it, and we watch for a few minutes until we start to see a yellow stain come out, the yellow stain of the bichromate come out into the water and um, tint it slightly yellow. At this point, we take a piece of cotton wool and very, very gently, we just tickle the pigment off the image. The dark parts of the image, hardened by the action of light through the negative, remain, and the highlights are washed away. It is at this point that careful touches can create the effect of drawing. This study in red by Dimashi is probably the most famous gum bichromate picture. Another method, the oil process, uses the principle that oil and water won't mix. Thinned out paint is built up on a photograph. The gelatin sensitized with bichromate has hardened in proportion to exposure during the printing as in the gum process. After a thorough soaking, the softened light areas hold water and reject the surplus oil when it is wiped off, while the hard gelatin absorbs the pigment.
by slowly working up the images, the photographer can control the densities, as is shown by Demarchi's three studies of a nude from the same negative. One often hears it asked, why did not this man paint his picture at first hand? The answer is quite simple, because he could not. There are men who possess a fine artistic perception and knowledge, but entirely lack the manipulative skill with either pencil or brush. Photography furnishes a medium of personal expression. Ideas like this were discussed in Camera Work, the magazine of the American group Photo Secession. They had banded together to defend their work from the dead hand of art photography and academic societies. Their leader, Alfred Stieglitz, had opted for the simplest equipment and the most direct approach. The writer does not approve of complicated mechanisms as they are sure to get out of order at important moments, thus causing considerable unnecessary swearing. A little blur in a moving subject will often aid in giving the impression of action and motion. Stieglitz literally stalked his subjects. He could wait as much as three hours before taking a photograph. Work like this was shown at the group's New York gallery. In the first 10 weeks of these exhibitions, the attendance was considerably over 3,000, and it included the best element of the New York public, although comparatively few photographers. The sales in the first two exhibitions amounted to $628, 19 prints finding purchases. Alphonse Mücher, the poster designer by Steichen. The artistic photograph answers better than any other graphic art to the special necessities of a democratic and leveling age like ours. I believe this is the principal reason why Steichen has chosen it as one of his mediums of expression. The work of Clarence White. He was another photographer who answered Stieglitz's challenge. We Americans cannot afford to stand still. We have the best of material among us, hidden in many cases. Let us bring it out. Let us make up our minds that we are equal to the occasion and prove to the photographic world at large that we are awake and interested in the progress of pictorial photography. Mrs. Kazebeer's photographs were shown in the magazine Camera Work, alongside those of international artists like J. Craig Allen of Glasgow. Alvin Langdon Coburn working in London. And Heinrich Kuhn of Austria. And all three were to work in colour in 1907. It was the first magazine to reproduce the new autochrome colour plates in 1908. From the first years of Herschel's blueprint process, Colour had been one of the aims of photography. As early as 1861, at a lantern lecture in London, James Clark Maxwell had projected three black and white photographs of a bow taken with red, green and blue filters. As the appropriate colours were added to the positive slides and the picture superimposed on each other, the audience was amazed to see the tartan restored. From this experiment stems every colour process we use today. Here is a modern print made up from Maxwell's original negatives. Using much the same principle, the black and white positives of the Ives chromoscope are viewed through the appropriate filters. But they have to be lined up very precisely if you are to get a clear image of geraniums. The Lippmann process used principles which gave perfect reproduction in theory. But because of exposures of a minimum of eight minutes, it could never be a commercial proposition. Also, it could only be seen in full colour from one angle to the light. These are experiments by Louis Lumiere, who was trying to develop it. Louis was the son of Antoine Lumiere who had settled in Lyon as a photographer after 1870. Both his sons, Auguste and Louis, were brought up in this old Roman city on the Rhone and both became brilliant scientists and inventors. Antoine's Art Nouveau Chateau on the corner of the factory lot is a symbol of the family's wealth. 
their fortunes had been founded upon the dependability of their blue label dry plates. The process and their manufacture had been worked out by Louis at the age of only 17. This wealth enabled him to devote time to experiment in many techniques, including three-color photography. As early as 1867, Ducot du Oran had made up photographs from three colored images, like a modern color photograph. And by 1877, he had achieved photographs as impressive as this landscape. Louis Lumiere was in close touch with him. Here is Lumiere's three-color stereo picture of old photographic equipment, following Du Ornon's system. In this process, the three separate positives, magenta, cyan and yellow, were laid down on paper as nearly in register with each other as possible. Two portraits are the only surviving examples still on their paper backing. Once lined up, they were transferred to glass to give greater translucency. And like all transfers, they could crack. Even so, Louis Lumiere's stereo colour slides caused such a sensation at a meeting in 1895 that his new cine film, shown at the same time, was almost ignored. He himself tells us why he found them difficult to produce commercially. It is impossible to determine the relative times of exposure and the strength of development of the three superimposed negatives, which are to represent the primary radiations of red, yellow and blue. It is equally impossible to evaluate the exposure times of the monochrome positives, their development and colour saturation. So Lumiere turned to the idea of combining all the elements of the process in a single plate. Tiny grains of potato starch were stained the three colours red, blue-violet and green and coated onto a glass plate. On this mosaic of filters was applied a black and white emulsion sensitive to all colours. After exposure through the filters, the emulsion was processed to give a positive image. The result was a colour transparency. But early autochromes of his family show he had problems to solve. Separating out grains of potato starch about 1 70th of a millimetre in diameter. Staining them with stable dyes of the same strength and intensity of colour. Mixing the grains evenly and spreading them on glass with minimum space between them. Filling the spaces with lamp black without disturbing the relationship of the grains and without drowning or smearing them with black. Spreading the layer under considerable pressure without breaking it up or cracking the supporting glass. Inventing a thin varnish to protect the layer from the emulsion. Sensitizing the prepared plates with a thin and dependable layer of photographic emulsion sensitive to all color radiations, etc., etc. All these difficulties, with a good few more, have involved research for several years, but they have all been solved one after another. And the plates now available from the Société Lumière make it possible, using ordinary photographic apparatus and with simple processing, to reproduce any subject with all the infinite variety of color as it appears in nature.
the small dots of the autochrome blend to a natural colour at a distance. This portrait of Louis on the left, with Auguste, is still at the experimental stage, about 1904. It was not until three years later that the autochromes became available to everyone. Special machines were invented to view the glass plates. Most autochromes are only known from muted colour reproduction in books. This film can capture some of the pleasure particularly remarked on by the American photographers. The brilliance of colour when the transparencies are backlit. A sceptical Stieglitz learned of Louis Lumiere's announcement in 1907. Good fortune willed it that early this June I was in Paris when the first results were to be shown at the photo club. Steichen went, illness kept me at home. Anxiously I awaited Steichen's report. His pretty good only satisfied my vanity of knowing it all. But that very month Stieglitz and Frank Eugene experimented with the new plates on a family visit to Germany. It's a positive pleasure to watch the faces of the doubting Thomases, the painters and art critics especially, as they listen interestedly about what the process can do. You feel their cynical smile. Then, showing them the transparencies, one and all faces look positively paralyzed, stunned. A color kinematic graphic record of them would be priceless. All are amazed at the wonderful luminosity of the shadows, the endless range of grays, the richness of the deep colors. In short, soon the world will be color mad and Lumiere will be responsible. George Bernard Shaw was equally enthusiastic. Steichen showed me some of the new Lumiere color plates and took a couple of portraits of me on them, 90 second exposure. They beat the three color business hollow. Shaw's autochromes have suffered with the years, but his portraits of his friends, the socialist Sidney Webb and his wife Beatrice, are evidence that colour photography was now within the reach of every man who could afford it. But one English amateur, J.C. Warburg, was a master of photography. When colour first comes to any process, there is always the temptation to be a little arty. to try and copy the subjects of a painter like Whistler, in terms of your own work. Here are Warburg's impressions of his family and the countryside of England in the years before 1914.
by 1913, a million autochromes were being produced each year, and magazines were using them for colour reproduction. Country Life photographed Munstered Wood, which belonged to the most celebrated gardener of the time, Gertrude Jekyll. By then, there were rumours of disturbances in the Balkans and German troop manoeuvres of war and mobilisation. In 1914, there was all too little time left to pose for the colour camera. During the Great War, the Lumiere brothers were to turn their inventive talents to the organisation of military hospitals and the development of artificial limbs. For the next four years, it was going to be a black and white world. Brother Bertie went away to do his bit the other day. With a smile on his lips and his left hand and pips upon his shoulders, bright and gay. As the train moved out, he said, Remember me to all the birds. And he wagged his paw and went away to war, shouting out these pathetic words. Goodbye, goodbye. Wipe the tear, baby dear, from your eye. Although it's hard to part, I know I'll be tickled to death to go Don't cry, don't sigh There's a silver lining in the sky Bonsoir, old thing, cheerio, chin, chin Now poop to look goodbye Goodbye, goodbye Wipe the tear, baby dear from your eye Although it's hard to part I know I'll be tickled to death to go Don't cry Don't sigh There's a silver lining in the sky Bonsoir Oh, think, cheerio, 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 cheer